Thank you for joining me again as we look here at the book of Proverbs and we are going to be looking at the last eight verses in Proverbs chapter number four, picking up where we left off. So verses 20 through 27. And I've mentioned before that Proverbs is written by Solomon as he is giving to his son uh, the wisdom that God has given to him and passing that on to his son to help his son live a godly life and a productive life, a fruitful life and a healthy life. Um, but as we read the book of Proverbs, let us not forget that though Solomon was the human instrument in writing the book of Proverbs, these words come directly from God. This is God's inspired word to us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means it's breathed out by. So God was the one that was literally giving the word. Solomon was the human instrument that God used to give us his word. So as we read the book of Proverbs, and as we read any scripture, but especially here as we read the book of Proverbs, we can see this as more than just a man, Solomon, giving his son wisdom. We can see it as God the Father giving to his children the wisdom that God wants them to have in this life. And there is so much wisdom in Proverbs. It's not just a book of belief and faith in the sense of doctrine, though there's doctrine in there. It is a book of practical wisdom. It tells us about human nature, tells us about our own nature, and shows us, uh, gives us, gives us a forward look as to how to live our life so that we can make good decisions. You know, when we're born into this world, we're not born with, my mom used to say, with an instruction booklet um, per se, although we have God's instruction in his word. And so that enlightens us. It shows us things that we would otherwise learn either through hard experience or not learn at all. So uh, let's look at Proverbs, not so much as Solomon giving his son wisdom, but as God giving us wisdom as well. And so let's look at the first three verses here. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22 which read, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. And so here again, Solomon talking about his words and his sayings and the words of wisdom. But I want you to notice the three, three areas he talks about having those words. He says in the first verse, verse 20, Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Verse 21, let them not depart from thine eyes and keep them in the midst of thine heart. So he's talking about the ear, the eye, and the heart. And this is really good advice to anyone, of course, as we seek to understand God's wisdom, we need to let his words, uh, first of all, enter into our ears. Jesus said more than once in the Gospels, and then it's repeated many times in the book of Revelation, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And what God is saying there is simply this, that though we have ears and though we hear things, we need to be listening to what it is we're being told. And as God gives us his wisdom, as God gives us his word, let it not be something that goes in one ear and out the other. So many times we're hearing things, but we're not truly listening. I'm guilty of that, and I'm sure you are as well. Someone will tell us something, and we hear it, and we forget it within moments, or... Uh, another thing that's often is someone will tell us something and we'll think, oh yeah, I'll remember that. That's important. And go about our day and then uh, not long after that or within a certain amount of time, it passes from our hearing. And uh, so, but hearing is important though. We must, but when we hear, we must hear with our ears listening purposefully to what it is we're being told. Some things we hear stick with us our entire lives. Some things we hear are here today, gone tomorrow. And a lot of that has to do with our attitude towards what it is we're hearing and whether or not we are truly listening. So when God is speaking, we need to not just be hearing the words. We need to be listening to what it is God is telling us with the intent of capturing what he tells us. It goes on in verse 21 to say, let them not depart from thine eyes. And when I read that, I'm reminded of the fact that in the, in the Israel, when God brought them into the promised land, one of the things God wanted them to do was to create visual reminders of his law. And so they would were told to engrave the laws of God over their doorposts of their house and on their gates so that they would see them when they were in their house, when they were coming in and going out. 
They are supposed to put fringes of blue upon their robes and on their garments so that they would be visual reminders of God's law to them and then bind them uh, to them between their eyes so that they could remember the laws of God. They were visual reminders. We have a very common saying in a society and it's out of sight, out of mind. And oftentimes that is the truth. If we're not presented with something or confronted with something, we tend to not pay that much attention to it unless it's really important to us. And the law of God can be the same way. Um, so God tells us, make sure it's in front of your eyes. You know, put the Bible in front of your eyes. Look at it. Many Christians will do that with putting up uh, pictures in their house with, with, with God's words or scriptures on their words. I used to do that when I was in college, especially take three by five cards. Now, some people do it with nice paintings and <laughs> nice pictures, but I used to take three by five cards and write scriptures down and put them in my car and on the walls of my, in my dormitory room and just different places that I looked. So therefore those words were reminders before my eyes all the time, because it's very easy as we go about our day to let things slip. But when they're in front of us and we're confronted with them all the time, they remind us of what they are. And then he says, keep them in the midst of thine heart. And what he's saying there is we ought to have the Bible or the words of God uh, in us, in our core being, inside of us, something that we remember. He's talking about memorization and meditation, two very important keys to remembering God's word, memorizing it, that is committing it to memory, uh, making it a part of us so that it's in a recall in our minds, we can bring it back. And then meditation, where we continually think about what it is God has told us throughout the day. Those two things will help us keep God's word in our heart so that if it's not something we're hearing with our ears actively all the time and not something that's presented always before our eyes because it's not there, it's in our hearts and we take it with us wherever we go. And I encourage you to memorize scripture, to find verses in the Bible that have great meaning to you or that have helped you or could help you and commit them to memory uh, so that they are with you always. If for some reason tomorrow the Bible was to disappear, if it was confiscated from us or for some reason it disappeared from, from our lives, how much of it would we have with us at that moment? If we could no longer carry it, if we could no longer read it or own it, how much of it would be a part of you? I'm not saying that we need to know all of it, every verse memorized, but it is good to have portions of scripture memorized so that it is with us at all time. He goes on to say in verse 22, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh, reminding us that it is God's word and the keeping of God's word that gives us good life and, and health. You know, some of the laws that God gives out that, that prohibit or, uh, or limit behaviors that uh, are oftentimes one's behaviors that God prohibits are unhealthy behaviors. Uh, and he's telling us not to do those things. Yes, they're morally wrong. But at the same time, prevent, by, by not doing them, they, they give us a longer and better quality of life. And so God doesn't put these rules here to prevent us from having fun and to limit us and, to, and, and, and just for the sake of limiting us and, and telling us things that we can't do to try and, and, and take away from us our options and our choices. What God is doing is he's putting up guardrails in our lives to protect us from falling off the cliff and actually harming ourselves and in our relationships and even our own health and so as the bible says his commandments are not grievous it means they're not overbearing and they're not harmful to us they are very helpful to us and then the last five verses here verses 23 through 27 god gives us some areas of our lives that we need to take extra care over things we need to guard and protect very carefully in our lives and you'll find that each of these is a trouble area uh, that we deal with. So let's look at the last five verses and then we'll go through each one individually. But let's read them together. Verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. That's the first area God tells us to guard is our heart. Uh, verse 24, put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. So our mouth, uh, verse 25, let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before thee. Our eyes, 26, ponder the path of thy feet. Okay, and let all thy ways be established. And verse 27, turn not to the right hand nor to the left, remove thy foot from evil. So we have five areas God wants us to guard very carefully in our lives. Uh, the heart, the mouth, the eyes, the feet, and the hands. And I think we used to sing a song as a kid, you know, be careful little eyes what you see. 
Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And uh, y y y y for the Father up above is looking down with love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. And then be careful, little he feet, where you go. And and I remember singing that as, as, as a child. And the basis of that being that there are certain areas in our life that are more susceptible to temptation, and we need to guard those very carefully. The first one is our heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And when the Bible talks about your heart, it's talking about your inner person. That part of you that is your core being, the part that feels, the part that thinks, the part that makes decisions, your attitude, and your very core part of you. God says guard that very carefully. When it says keep, it's saying guard. Put a guard up against what you allow to enter into your heart because the heart is one of those things that's from, from your heart proceeds everything. Jesus told his disciples when, and those around him when, when, they, were, when they, they were questioning the disciples as to why they didn't wash their hands before they eat, ate because it would make them unclean. Jesus said, it is not what you put in you that makes you unclean in the sense of the food you eat. So you eat with unwashed hands. Okay, the food goes in your mouth and your stomach and then that's the end of it. You know, it, it's over. He said, but what, what makes a person unclean is what comes out of you. Murders, adulteries, fornications, lying. A thievery, all those things, because he said those things proceed from the heart, the evil thoughts from the heart. And so what God is saying is protect your heart very carefully. Protect it. And the heart is deceitful. Jeremiah tells us that. Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the core being, if left unchecked and unguarded and unprotected by what goes on in the world, will be uh, hurt, will be damaged, will be wounded, and turn bitter and start to, evil things will begin to proceed from our heart. So we must protect our heart very carefully from being wounded and hurt and, and deceived and driven away from God. Verse 24, second thing is the mouth, put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. He's saying, guard your mouth and what comes out your mouth. Um, oh boy. How many times do we get ourselves into trouble with what we say or the things that proceed out of our mouth? Uh, I can think of many times in my life where I spoke too soon, spoke without understanding, spoke too hastily, spoke too angrily, spoke too sarcastically, said more than I should have said. Oh, so many things. But you know, once it comes out your mouth, it's not like you can press the re rewind button and suck it back in and take it away. It's out and it's gone and you can't undo what you said. Now, you may be able to ask for forgiveness and apologize, but you can't undo it. Once it comes out your mouth, it's out. It's loose. And uh, and so better it is to keep things in than to always let things out. Uh, we need to put a guard over our mouth. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. And, uh, and there are times we have to speak, absolutely, and we must speak the truth and, and tell things as they are. But there are times where it's best not to, especially if we're at a, at a moment of anger or frustration with someone or something. Um, but the froward mouth, the word froward, of course, meaning uh, a crooked or not being able to see very far down the road. He's saying, listen, be, be straightforward when you talk. Be straightforward, but be kind. What does the Bible say? We have to speak the truth in love, right? Perverse lips put far from thee. I reminded the Apostle Paul said, let no, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. But boy, we just want to get things off our chest. And, and you know, I heard this and, and, and I'm going to talk about it, even though I haven't verified it. And I don't even know if it's true, but have you heard what happened with so-and-so? And have you heard what they're saying about so? I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard this about so-and-so. And what are we doing? We're gossiping. We're tearing people down and we're being destructive. We can be very destructive with our mouths or we can be very encouraging and building with our mouths. It's our choice. And so, but we need to protect it. We need to guard it. And uh, sometimes that means keeping it shut, and all the time it means putting a filter on and, and protecting what comes out of our mouth. Uh, verse 25, let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before thee. And he's telling us that we must guard very carefully what we choose to place before our eyes. And also be prepared because oftentimes, sometimes there's, we're going to be confronted with things that get placed before our eyes we had no control over. And, uh, but I am reminded of this as I consider the scripture that sin began with a glance. It began with a look. 
Satan came to Eve and said to Eve, um, you know, uh, can you eat from all the trees of the garden? And Eve said, no, all but one. And, 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 and told him why. And Satan lied to Eve. And then the Bible says, and when she saw that the tree was good for food. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof. So it all began with a look when she saw the tree was good. If she'd kept her eyes away from it and never looked at it and never went in that direction, a good chance she would have never taken from it. But when she saw, she desired. And that's what happened with Achan. He saw a wedge of gold. He saw a Babylonian garment. He desired them and took them. It all began with a glance, a look. That's what happened to David when he was walking along uh, the, the wall of the castle when he should have been out to battle. And the Bible says he saw a woman who was bathing. And so most of a lot of our troubles, a lot of our problems begin with what we allow to come before our eyes, what we allow to see, because our eyes are the doorway into our heart. So we must very carefully protect what we choose to place before our eyes. Let us choose to place things that are godly and righteous. And when the world presents things before us that we have no choice over, let us avert our gaze and protect very carefully our eyes. Uh, then he says, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. He's talking, of course, about the places that we go, verse 26. And he's saying we need to guard very carefully, especially as Christians, the, pl the company we choose to keep and the places we choose to go, because they're going to have an impact upon us. You know, where we choose to go in life is going to determine a lot. You know, where we choose to go... Uh, could determine where we work, could determine our friends, could determine who we marry, uh, and determine the activities we choose to involve ourselves in. And so let us not place ourselves into areas where we will be tempted to do what's wrong, but let us take our feet with us, or let us use our feet rather to take us to places where we can share the gospel with others. As the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of them that spread or that, that bring good news that preach good news and spread good tidings uh, so let us be those that spread the gospel with our feet and not be allowing our feet to take us to places of sin and mischievousness and lastly verse 27 turn not to the right hand nor to the left remove thy foot from evil and when i think of that right hand or the left i think i've mentioned it before in that culture the right hand was always considered your hand of strength and authority and your left hand was the hand that was considered to be a weaker and what he's saying there is do not let your strengths uh drag you away from the lord or take you away from god and do not let those things areas in your life where you are weak do the same i've seen that happen in both cases where someone allows an area where they become very strong in and very gifted in to then be used for their own glory and their own prestige and their own fame rather than use it for the Lord. Uh, some of God allows somebody uh, maybe to, uh, to, be very, to be very good and skilled and, 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 and very, have a good understanding, maybe about finances or business. Uh, maybe they're a good speaker, motivational speaker, or they're a good singer, or they're very talented and they work hard in some area in their life. And they become very strong in it. And instead of giving it to the Lord and using it for his honor and glory, it takes them away from the Lord because they want the glory and prestige for themselves. And I've also seen the other side where someone has a weakness and they, they may be an addiction or maybe they, they find an area where they falter and stumble or they don't feel very qualified in. And instead of trusting God to use them, uh, they look to others who are more qualified and say, well, I'm never going to be like that and I'm never going to be that person there. And they turn away from the Lord because of some weak area in their life. What God is telling us is this, you got, you got strengths and you got weaknesses. God knows what they are. He knows what they are. He made you. He put you together that way. So trust God with them. Let God use them as he sees fit. As he sees fit, rather. Uh, God uses the weak things of this earth to confound the mighty and the base things of this earth to confound the wise. God knows what he's doing. He's given you your abilities. He's given you your skills. He gives them to you for a purpose, to use them for him, to glorify him in them, not to allow them to pull you away from him, but to bring you closer to him as you trust him to use them on your everyday life. Uh, so God's words, powerful words there, powerful, powerful words. Let us hear them. Let us keep them before our eyes. Let us keep them in the midst of our, our hearts and then protect the areas of our life where we are most prone to fall. Well, God bless you. I hope it's been a blessing to you and I hope to see you all again very, very soon.